Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Okay? Warren, I think Anne's trying to get your attention. Okay? So again, apologies for the technical stuff. It's just how it happens. <laughs> okay? So, as I said, we are in the midst of a series of messages that have this title or this theme. How we endure. And I'll, I'm going to really try hard not to go and review everything that we've already said, but I will say this much. Number one, it is very clear, both from the scriptures and from our own experience, that the will of God does not automatically work out. Okay? I, I say that in case there is somebody that still is affected by the thought that if God wants something, it always comes about. It is right to say that there are certain things that God has declared is his will that are coming whether we participate or not. If all of us took a vote, if every human being took a vote and said, we do not want Jesus to come back, it's still going to happen. Okay? So there are certain things that are the will of God that do not require human intervention. But much of the deliverance that God wants you to experience in your life because of the cross requires your participation. It is essential that you reject this notion that if God wants something, it'll just happen. It'll just happen. It is not true. Okay? Now, we are in a time of grace. We are in a time where we are entitled to experience and enjoy things we could never deserve. It is all on the basis of what Jesus did for us. By faith in him, we are able to participate of things we could never, ever deserve. Okay? The time before this was a time of law, where all of God's dealings were on a contractual basis. Okay? If you do, if you keep your end of the bargain, I will keep my end of the bargain, says God. Okay? And yet, even in that time of law, I would like to say there was actually a time of grace. You know, God did not have to come and tell the people of Israel, here's my bargain with you. He could have just left them alone. He didn't have to. They did not deserve it. There was nothing about who they were that compelled God. In his mercy and his grace, he said, Here's how we're going to work this out. Now, he had a purpose in the law. And, you know, we who have come to, the, to Jesus, and if you've looked a little bit in the scriptures, you will come to realize the purpose of the law was always to show you that you're never going to measure up. God will always do his part, but you're not likely to always do your part. And so God has to have a better system to this. And he said, that's exactly what's going to happen. I'm doing my part. You guys don't do your part. So I myself am going to come and do something whereby you can be delivered. And that's what Jesus is all about. Okay? Jesus came because he knew that we could never fulfill the righteous requirements of the law. But even in that time of the law, God says this. Listen, I'm setting before you life and death, blessing and curse. I'm putting it before you. And whatever I want for your life is what's going to happen, says the Lord. False. God is not, the, 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 the doctrine of God should not lead you to fatalism. Fatalism is the idea, you know, um, 
Back in the 60s, there was a song, Que Sera Sera. Uh, there's some people here old enough to remember the song. Uh, what's her name? Doris, Doris Day sang, Que Sera Sera. Whatever will be, will be. This idea of whatever has been ordained by the fates is what's going to happen. And somehow, that way of thinking has infiltrated the church. It's not from the scriptures. Okay? God's sovereignty does not mean He makes things to work out exactly as He wants for your life. And so if you're sick and miserable, it's because He wanted it. You know, there's a, I, I don't think this is authentic, but I heard that there's a Jewish proverb that says, there is a false Jewish proverb that says, if you see a man down on his luck, kick him harder. Why should you be kinder to him than God? What a wicked thing to say about the living God. What an atrocious thing to say. And yet, many Christians absorb that way of thinking. If it's supposed to be something different, God would have seen to it. And so they struggle trying to believe God for something that they're not convinced He really wants them to have. That has to stop. You cannot live with two minds. The double-minded person should expect to receive exactly one thing. Nothing. So if you think God made you sick, but you need to believe God to heal you, how is that going to work? You know, people who are sitting, dying from a, 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 a terrible disease, and then they say, well, God has some purpose in it. God has some purpose in it. Have you noticed, let me not take too long to say that, people in that circumstance still want people to pray and ask that, God's will, you know, that God would deliver them. So what am I saying? God, you want me sick, but I'm supposed to ask you to make me not sick. You want me sick, but don't... But how does that not tie you in knots? It puts you in a religious place where you say words that you don't expect because you're convinced that God wants it like this. You have to reject that. That is a stronghold raised up in the minds of people to keep them from knowing what God really wants. How do you know what God wants? What did Jesus do? How many people did Jesus say? Okay, let's, let's not deny that there are people who say, well, you know, God has some purpose in this misery that I'm going through. I'll just, I'm just trusting the Lord. He has some purpose for letting this happen to me. Maybe he just wants me to grow in my uh, devotion to him. You know, I've been living a life that's here and there, and now I've really been focused on God. So God is doing great things in the midst of this circumstance. So, how many people, when Jesus walked the earth, how many people did he say, when somebody says, you know what, my daughter is cruelly demon-possessed, and Jesus said, daughter, it would be better for you that she stays demon-possessed, because then you will learn to really depend on God. How many people did he say that to? Zero. The natural number to use there is exactly zero. How many people did he say, it is better for you to be sick than well? Zero. How many people, and remember, it's not hard to imagine that many of the people that were healed by him were also crying out, crucify him! How many people did he ever reject? There were people who he could legitimately reject their request. Okay? There were two cases. Remember, Jesus came to fulfill what God had said would happen for the Jews. And through that, bless all of the nations. Jesus came to the Jews. He was the fulfillment of promises made to the Jews. They were the ones who had the right as he put it, to eat the children's bread. And in two circumstances, people who were not Jews came and asked him for help. One was a Roman centurion who said, my servant is sick, but you could heal him. And Jesus said, okay, I'll come, which is an extraordinary thing, because Jews were not supposed to go and into the house of Gentiles. And this guy says, no, 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 you don't need to come. You just need to say the word, and it'll be done. And Jesus was astonished. He said, I have not seen this kind of faith amongst the children of Israel. The second situation 
where he started by saying, no, a woman, a Syrophoenician woman, a woman who was a Gentile, a woman who was of the culture of demon worshippers who lived around the Jews, said to Jesus, my daughter is cruelly demon possessed. Please deliver. And Jesus ignored her. Jesus ignored her. Wouldn't say anything to her. And finally the disciples said, please do something. She's bothering us. And Jesus then says, it is not right to take the children's bread and give it to dogs. Okay? So what did he just say? She's a dog. She's not entitled to this. That's as close as you can get to God saying no. And yet, you can almost see God's smile behind the scene. Because he, he was waiting for the next line that the woman said. You're right. It's not right to take the children's bread and give it to dogs. But even the dogs can eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. She didn't take offense. She just clung to her belief that God wants my daughter well. And Jesus was overwhelmed. He said, go your way. Your faith has saved your daughter, basically. And he was marveled. He was amazed. That was two cases where he had the legal grounds to say no. And what did he say? Yes. So this notion that has somehow infiltrated the church through history, through experience. I mean, let's face it. If you've had the experience of some terrible thing happen to you and you were praying and praying and praying as best as you knew how and you had everybody else praying for you and it didn't work, you ended up losing that part of your body or you lost that child or somebody you were praying for died. If we're not careful, we take our experience and build a doctrine from it. Well, that must mean God did not want it. Therefore, God does not always want someone to be saved. God does not always want someone to be healed. You know, a good part of the body of Christ believes these sorts of things. It is part of their official doctrine. If you've ever heard of something called Calvinism, go look it up yourself. Now, the, the, the thing to be mindful of is the people who say that they follow that doctrine don't necessarily hold to everything that is a part of that. Okay? But one of the essential elements of Reformed theology is the idea that Jesus did not die for everyone. He only died for those who would become Christians. Okay? So a corollary of that, an extension of that is, God does not love everyone. Because this is the only way the people who hold to this way of thinking can make all the pieces fit. They can't explain. Why is it that some people don't get saved? Look, if you're saying that God loves them all, and what God wants, He always gets, then if they were loved by God, they would be saved by God. So since they're not saved by God, God does not love everybody. Makes perfect sense. Unless you look closely and see that it defies everything you see about what God is like as manifested in Jesus. So we have to take care. I say all of this. How did I even get here? Oh yes. The will of God does not automatically work out. It requires your participation. It really does. Okay? We uh, participated in some ways when we had communion together today. Right? There is a participation. There is a, I see the promise of God. It is for me. I receive it. And then you work with it until everything within you is in agreement with it, and then God says, oh, now I can help you. It's almost like God saying, I so want to help you. Will you simply say yes? Please, say yes. Say yes. And that saying yes is more than, yes, my, I, I, I'm not against God helping me. Did you know that it's possible to have the thought within you that God really loves you, but he won't do this for me. It is impossible. Nobody in this condition has ever been healed but I know God loves me. So you don't see that even though you think you're saying yes, you're actually saying no. By his stripes, you have been healed, except you weren't, is how you think. That has to change. 
There is a participation with God that brings about the deliverance from every kind of thing that could afflict a human being. It is there. Jesus died to set you completely free, and God is so completely for it. Right? We, as the sons and daughters of God, we who God wants to use to represent him to the earth, okay? we need to carry this message. God is completely for your deliverance. He's completely on board. He really wants it. He's done everything that's necessary. Will you take it? Will you receive it? God so loved just some of the world that he gave his only begotten son. No, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that now whoever believes in him won't perish. They'll have eternal life. John chapter 3, verse 16. The entire message of the scriptures in one sentence. And also insight as to how things work. The will of God does not automatically work out. You need to participate. Point number three. The devil hates the idea of you participating with God to see deliverance in your life and then through your life. He hates it. So he works over time to prevent it. He cannot physically prevent it. That's not how the devil works. Remember, Jesus rendered powerless him who had the power of death. That's what the scriptures say. Because of the death of Jesus on the cross and his resurrection and ascension, we can say with certainty Jesus defeated the devil. Okay. Now, some of that is going to play out. There is coming a day when he will be bound, the devil will be bound and thrown into the lake of fire that burns forever. There is coming a day. That is happening. But between when Jesus died on the cross and that day, God wants the victory that Jesus won to be progressively enforced in the life of every person who believes him. And he wants to use those people to help somebody else. Okay? We pointed this out. I'm going to run out of time again. We pointed this out last time. When Jesus rose from the dead, how did he arise? How many people saw it? Okay, Maybe a maximum. At that time on the earth, it may, it may have been, I'm only guessing here, so please don't hold me to it. There would have been maybe uh, 100 million people on the globe. Okay, How many people did the resurrected king of kings to whom everything belongs appear to? Well, first to a, a girl, then to his disciples who couldn't believe the girl, then to maybe 400 more who were gathered together in a room. But that's it. He didn't go and show up to Pontius Pilate and say, hey, what do you think now? He didn't show up in the council chambers of the, of the, the Sanhedrin and say, now what do you think? Am I the Messiah or not? He could have done all of that, right? He could have snapped his fingers and every human being on the face of the globe would know Jesus is Lord and you must come and bow your knee before him if you're going to be saved. He could do it, but that's not how he does it. He chooses to use you and me because the grace of God is designed to work by faith. You have to hear a report that you personally are convicted to receive. That's about me. That's for me. That's for me. So here's where the devil works. He tries to interfere with your receiving what God has for you, what God says to you. This is where the devil works. Okay? We recognize that there can be something called the spirit of infirmity that bounds up a person. But I will say this. Anybody who is afflicted by a spirit of infirmity gave that spirit an opportunity. Okay? That doesn't change the fact that God wants them delivered. Okay? Please... Don't be sitting there saying, well, you deserve this. It's shame on you. Because, you know, you could say that about yourself and all the stuff that you're afflicted with. Somewhere you gave the devil an opportunity. It wasn't God who did that. You said yes when you should have said no. You said no when you should have said yes. And God doesn't look at you and say, you made your bed. You got to lie in it. That is not scripture. Okay? So, yes... There may be a spirit of infirmity, and yes, you may have said to it, but you know what God's reaction to that is? I still want you delivered from it. It is illegal. It is wrong that this child of mine be held by this. I want you to go do something about it, Titus. We 
Where does the devil work? He works by attacking your mind. Okay? 2 Corinthians chapter 10. We only have time for this. I don't, I, last week I made it like I was going to give this long teaching about these three aspects of the devil's weaponry against us. And I realized that's going to take us off track. My goal here is to set the course for this coming year that whatever comes, whatever comes, we endure. Okay? And I don't mean we just grin and bear it. We just oh, suffer. We just, uh. You know that picture? I found that picture, if anybody wants to see it, um, of this cat that's hanging on the end of a string. And it says over it, hang in there, baby. This is not what God means by endure. Okay? This is not what God means by endure. Just, just cling. Just, just wait it out. Just hold on until maybe it comes to pass. This is not the idea of endure. The idea of endure that the scriptures paint has to do with a continual being strengthened because you're looking to Jesus and so you're able to go through whatever it is that is happening until the will of God comes to about. Okay? We are not talking about an endurance, you know, sort of like... Um, you know, there, there are philosophical ideas that have to do with how you approach life. Um, uh, well, you might have heard of something like Stoicism, okay, the Stoics. Just life is something to be born, and, you, and, and how you go through life, and I'm not an expert on Greek philosophy, so please don't take this as the definition of Stoicism, but what really matters in life is how you go through it. Okay? That whatever happens, you just have the right attitude. Um, some, of the Eastern myth some of the Eastern philosophies like um, Buddhism and, and you know, the things that come from Japan have this idea about life being something you just need to take in stride. This is not the idea that God is setting before us when he says you need to endure. Okay? The idea that God is setting before you is this. The outcome is sure. Don't you give up until it happens. Do you follow what I'm saying? So, let's say you are working out some physical affliction in your body. You received a diagnosis, um, whatever. You see a, some pain, whatever. And you have enough sense to know, actually, Jesus said that by his stripes I was healed. That this is not from God. So you begin to work this out. Okay? God is not looking to see just how far can I get this person to stick with it. And if they stick with it long enough, then maybe I'll heal them. Okay? So healing is not the reward for endurance. Do you follow what I'm saying? Healing, the deliverance that God has purchased, the, 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 the freedom that is the will of God, is not a reward for you being a good boy or a good girl and enduring through all this bad stuff that makes God look bad. and You just stick with it until it happens. That is the wrong idea to have about what God is talking about. What God is saying is in this context, listen, the world is not operating how I wanted it to operate. The kingdom, the king of that place is not me. Do you recall, Jesus said, the king of this world is coming when he was about to be crucified. Who was he talking about? Hands up. Who was he talking about? Norm? Well, wait a second. God is the king of this world. Why would God be talking? Why would Jesus be talking about Satan then? Obviously, he meant God, right? Because God is the king of the world. That's not what Jesus thought. What an astonishing thing to, to, to think through. It isn't to say that God isn't God and he isn't sovereign. Man made choices that meant the devil got to do what man was supposed to do. Do you remember that in the beginning, God gave dominion to who? Adam. And the devil usurped, took away that dominion through his trickery. And so what has been happening on the face of the earth is not automatically the will that God has. It is the will of an evil one who hates God. And God says, you are my ambassador to a foreign kingdom, and I want my will to be done on the earth as it is in heaven. I want to do my will through you in a hostile place. I want my will to be done through you in a hostile place. So all of the endurances in this context, you are living in a hostile environment. You are living in a hostile environment.
but what God has said is sure, see it through. Well, how do I see it through? That's what Hebrews chapter 12 says. Okay? Before I get to Hebrews chapter 12, let me just remind you. What are, the, what are the weapons that are divinely powerful? What is the warfare against? He mentions three things. Our weapons are divinely powerful. We do not war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for what? The destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we're taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. At the end of the day, the only game the devil has to play is to persuade you to stop. The greatest danger in your life and mine is that we lose heart. Because what God has set before you is sure. It is for sure there. Yes, we may not understand all of the ins and outs and the whys of why this is taking so long and what's happening. We don't have such great insight into ourselves that we can just automatically say, oh, this will take just three days. God knows all those things. But what he also makes clear is, listen, it is my will that you be completely well. See it through. And then he says, there is an adversary who's going to try and get you to lose heart. There is an adversary who's going to use thoughts, speculations. He's going to try and build in your mind fortresses that are against what I am like that he can attack you from. And you have to pull those down. How? We're destroying speculations. You have to... Again, at another time, we'll do this more in mind. But what I want to say is how the devil persuades you to lose heart involves making things seem bigger than they really are. At the very least, this. This is a problem not even God can help me with. Okay? That looks in different ways. Nobody has ever recovered from this sickness. I've only got three days to live. If I had six, maybe I could do something about it. But three, nothing. And even more insidious is, yeah, God, maybe he could do something about it, but he ain't going to, because you are a worthless piece of garbage. He told you so many times to do what is right, and you never do it, so God is just done with you. He's not going to help you. Speculations. None of that comes from the sure word of God. None of that. Where is it written, this is too difficult for me, says the Lord. If you had come to me three weeks ago, I may have been able to do something. But now, this is too difficult for me, says the Lord. If you ever have a word of prophecy that comes to you and says, this is too much for me, you know it's not God. Okay? Any notion, any idea that says impossible with God isn't coming from God, unless it is this. It is impossible for God to lie. That's impossible. Okay? But this is what the devil does. How does he use it? He uses our experiences. He uses, he uses our f- foolish and false conclusions. Sometimes we think very poorly about things. i give you an example before. If God loved everybody... If God wanted everybody to be saved because God gets whatever he wants, then everybody would be saved. Therefore, since everybody is not saved, God does not want everybody saved. What is the problem there? Where is, is that sound reasoning? There is a fault in the middle of that chain of statements. God gets whatever he wants. If you take that out of the equation, then you begin to see, oh, maybe that's not a reasonable conclusion. Maybe the problem here is that God has done everything for every person to be saved, but he has decided to wait to see if they will choose it. Will you receive him? Who has believed our message? Will you receive him? Then other things fall into place. Likewise, faulty reasoning brings us to the place where, yeah, this is too difficult for God. Nobody has ever been delivered from a sickness like this. 
Do you know what you should think if you're in that circumstance and you believe the Lord? Nobody has ever been delivered from a sickness like this until I came along. Because I'm going to be the first. One of my favorite movies is um, The Princess Bride. I don't know, again, dating myself here. Okay? There's a line in there where they're caught in this terrible circumstance. Okay? They have to go through the, the, the fire swamp, as it were. And um, the hero and his, and his girl, the girl says, nobody's ever survived the fire swamp. And his response is, nonsense. You're only saying that because no one has ever done it before. Nobody's ever been healed from this sickness. Nonsense. You're only saying that because nobody until you has ever done it. It is false to conclude it cannot be done. But this is where strongholds, where the devil reaches in. Everybody that you prayed for died. So therefore, when you pray for this person, they're going to die. False. Speculations. We don't have time, but we talked about worry last year. Anxiety last year. What is worry? What is anxiety? It is a preoccupation over something that has not actually happened. It is a speculation, and it only leads to evil doing. It opens a door for the devil to come and have his strategy work in your life. That's why worry is such a dangerous thing. Do you understand what I mean? Is there anybody who worries about the fact that yesterday was Sunday or Saturday? You don't worry about a thing that happened yesterday. Okay? If you look carefully at the worries in your life, even if they stem from something that happened yesterday, what you're really worried about is what that will mean for tomorrow. Worry is always over something that hasn't happened. And out of our habit, we make room for it, and the devil gets, yes! I have another means to come in and just agitate them enough so that they don't see this, they're going to win if they stay on this course. That's what the devil is desperate to prevent you from seeing, that if you stay your course, you win. Okay? Or let me put it differently. If you stay your course, you get to have Jesus' victory. Because he won. Jesus did win. He's not winning. He's not winning. He won. And what God wants is for you to enjoy that victory, you personally, over the devil. Okay? God wants you to take Jesus' victory and apply it in your life so that you are winning. But he won. The devil is desperate to keep you from seeing that. Okay? And yes, it would be good at, at a time for us to say, so how do we counteract that? How do we pull down speculations? How do we pull down these imaginations? You running wild instead of just letting what God says rule you. You giving your mouth to worry instead of giving your mouth to what God has said. It would be good for us to come up with strategies, but I'll give you, for the sake of our time here and our purpose here, since we have to end here, exalt the Lord. Exalt the Lord. Do you know what I'm, what does the word exalt mean? Can somebody give me a definition? Exalt, for the English challenged among us. Exalt, does somebody have a phone that has an internet connection that can look up a dictionary? Find the word exalt according to whatever, well, not whatever dictionary comes up, but some reputable dictionary. What does the word exalt mean? Not exalt, exalt. Held in high regard. Held in high regard. Held in high regard. Any other um, further definition for it? Held in high regard. Well, I exalt you. What does that mean? What am I doing to you? What? Oh, you're talking to Siri. Siri's not always that helpful. Show or feel triumphant, elation or jubilation. That's exalt. I mean exalt. E X A L T. Quickly, we're running out of time here. Okay. Bless, boost, build up. Build. The idea underneath, when we say we exalt the Lord, is to make him high in our minds and thoughts. 
Question. Does your making him big make him big? The glorify. glorify. Praise. Praise. You know what? For the purpose here, let me just use a different word. Magnify. Okay? So, we're going to magnify the Lord. I tell you, here's a strategy, even though we don't have time to dig into everything. Here's a strategy that you could use for your life. Always magnify the Lord. Okay? What are we saying? Are we saying that by your words, God gets bigger and bigger and bigger? No, he is great. He is high. He is the Holy One. In, in, in books and in the scriptures, we get glimpses of when people actually see the Lord and they are left speechless. When we are told to exalt him, what we are saying is, in your mind, he's not big enough, so you make him big in your mind, in your experience. Make him as big as he really is. Your problem is too big for you. Or as some people put it, your God is too small. That's why you're having trouble. That's the work of the devil. So, make it a practice. I will exalt the Lord. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. I will continually say, God is better than this. He's bigger than this. There's nothing he cannot do. There's nothing he cannot do. And there's nothing he will not do for me. You have to exalt him. Speculations and imaginations have to be put in their proper place by seeing God as who he is. Right? And that's where we're going to end in Hebrews chapter 12. For consider him who endured such hostility against himself by sinners so that you do not grow weary and lose heart. We recognize the possibility of growing weary and losing heart. And I think everyone in this room, I'll, 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 I'll stand in, your, in the gap for you as it were, I've had that experience of growing weary and losing heart. It is not uncommon, unfortunately, in the lives of Christians. But it is not necessary. It is possible to look away to Jesus, as, as our sister encouraged us earlier. It is possible to look away to Jesus and be strengthened as you recognize who he is. Consider him. He is the one who loved me perfectly. You know, there are people in their sincerest devotion to God. I'm not talking about Christians. There are people in their sincerest devotion to God have come up with or have listened to and embraced a framework that cannot imagine God loves them. Okay? It isn't that they reject God loves them. It makes no sense to say it. God is not a God. God is God. He doesn't love. He just is God, and you need to honor him. And all of their uh, devotion, all of their worship flows from this idea of this exalted, uh, glorified being that has nothing to do with human beings. And if we, if we do everything right, then maybe he'll be merciful to me. And even on their deathbed, they say, be merciful to me. If you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm talking about uh, Islam. Okay? A, a very, very compressed and compact idea that, of God in, in Islam. And I'm not criticizing, I'm not putting them down. I'm simply trying to say there are people who do not realize that God loves them. That is one of the most important things you have to hold high as you work out your life. Why did Jesus come willingly? Because he so loved me. You guys are a bonus, but he loved me. He loved Titus. And you need to put your name there. People have said it, and there is a, there's a drawback to this way of thinking that makes it sound like what Jesus did on the cross, its only goal was us, and that's not true. But people have put it this way. If I was the only human being that was ever born, Jesus would have still come. He's not thinking in terms of quantity. Well, if there was two, it would be worth my time. He would have come just for me. He would have come just for me. Case in point, he came for me. It tells you of the love that God has for you. This is what the devil will try to undermine in your life. But this is what you must consider so that you do not grow weary and lose heart. How much God loves you. We suffer things. We go through terrible things. People that we are around, I mean, I've heard terrible, heartbreaking stories in the news. I've gotten to the point where I don't even want to read the news story because it's just so heartbreaking what people go through. And as Linda so helpfully encouraged us to remember, the first heart that breaks is God's. 
He so loves us. If he so loves us, is he going to hold out on you in terms of deliverance? No. Is he trying to see how many hoops he can get you to jump? No. None of that is the issue. You exalt him as he is. He is the high and mighty one who can do all things and nothing is too difficult for you. And not only is nothing too difficult for you, he likes me and he's willing to help me. This is how you grow, don't grow weary and lose heart. You must cultivate the practice of exalting the Lord and considering who and what he did for you. And be fueled by it, waiting, enduring something until the will of God comes to pass. For the Christian has everything to do with being involved with him and being strengthened by him. A power that comes from heaven flowing through you because you are willing to do what he says that enables you to endure what otherwise you couldn't. The endurance that we are granted the privilege of is not a human ability. This is not a pep talk. It is, here's the secret of your life. Jesus died to save you and he is everything for you. You cling to him. Do not let the devil undermine what God has revealed about what he is like in your life. In this coming season, well, for the rest of your life, there are things that God wants you to experience. There are deliverances that God wants you to both have and see worked out in somebody else's life. You are the ambassador of the living God. You. And he wants the kingdom of God to come through you. The will of God to be done through you. And it's going to require endurance. It's not because God just likes to make you run hard. It's because you have an adversary who is ferocious. It's because we are not as strong as we think we are. It is because there are things that have to fall into place. There are bigger things going on than just your problem. But whatever may be going on, you will need to endure. How will you do it? Exalt the Lord. Get caught up in what you do know about Him. Get caught up with what you do know about Him. That always makes room for more. If you don't use what you do have about God, how will you endure? Endurance is not you need some extra thing. It is be faithful with what you do have of the Lord. Consider Him. This passage is not revealing something that the people that it was being written to did not already know, but they were being forcefully directed to it. There is a need for endurance. Here's how. You need to endure. Here's how. Consider Him who loved you, who gave himself for you, and all the things that flow from it. Okay, I'm going to end there. I, I really appreciate it.